Hey guys, welcome everyone. We have Naresh Jain with us for the today's topic that is avoiding the API collapse or and API resilience testing. Over to you, Naresh. Uh, thanks, Alab, uh, for the wonderful introduction. Thanks everyone for joining in. So cool. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, I I would like to keep this interactive uh, and make sure that you are able to get the most out of this session. So please do uh, you know. Keep your chat windows open. I'm going to keep uh, asking you for questions and hoping that you can uh, put comments in the chat window and that's how we will be able to uh, interact. Uh, also, I think you would be able to show hands uh, when I have uh, questions and that would give me feedback if uh, everyone's following along with me. So cool, uh, a fancy background generated by ChatGPT. Uh, that's kind of become a must have for every conference talk these days. So that's what I have to do. Uh, but this talk is really about, uh, you know, my experience of building really resilient APIs, uh, you know, that work at really large scale. Uh, and so this is kind of, uh, some of the background around how to make that happen in your own organization. Uh, so with that, I'm going to quickly jump in. Uh, I'm going to take a quick, uh, uh, you know, example here to just explain the architecture of an application, and then we will have a little bit of a questions in terms of how uh, we will make these things resilient. Okay, so I'm going to take again something that all of you must be very familiar. You have an app. The app makes a request to a backend for front end. Uh, this backend for front end may depend on one or more actual domain services. So it makes a uh, request to the domain service. It gets a response back from the domain service. It does some business logic and then it basically posts uh, a message on a Kafka topic so that, uh, you know, a, an analytics service could pick up and do its thing. Uh, and then get back the response to the application, right? Like this is a very simple application, but there are a lot of things that actually can go wrong in this simple application. Uh, so I want you to think about uh, from a resiliency point of view, right? Let's say I am uh, thinking about this BFF layer over here. Let me quickly highlight uh, that. So let's say I have this BFF layer and uh, I want to make sure that this BFF layer is very resilient. Uh, subsequently, we will also make sure that this domain service is also very resilient. Uh, and finally, we also want to make sure that this Kafka guy is also very resilient, right? So these are all the pieces that technically could have some kind of a fault or some kind of a problem. And that could make the overall experience for the user uh, who's using the app not so pleasant, right? So we, uh, our, our job here, uh, you know, as quality engineers is to make sure that uh, the experience here on the app is seamless, which means the uh, these various moving parts that we depend on are actually very resilient, right? Uh, so in your chat windows, if you can quickly, uh, you know, put what are the kinds of things that can actually go wrong? Um, of course, here I'm just highlighting that these have API specifications and async API specifications as well. Uh, but what what are the kinds of things uh, from a resiliency point of view that you think can go wrong in this case? If you can just uh, pop open your chat windows and uh, you know put in there, uh, it'll be helpful. Okay, so I see network latency. Uh, network latency between these services could cause a problem, certainly. Uh, server could go down, which server, right? There are many servers here and any one of them could go down and we don't really seem to have a uh, redundancy in place, at least in this simplistic diagram that I've shown you. So that's certainly a good uh, possibility. Uh, the response time and network latency, you know, both of those could be certainly an issue. Kafka could choke the topics on Kafka. We could overwhelm Kafka and it may not be able to process and then that might get choked. Uh, you know, too many requests at a time yeah so uh, your you, you could have uh, you know a runaway success and your app you know could be maybe downloaded by uh, billions of people and they all try and hit this uh, thing and then there might be too many requests that is basically causing a problem there could be disk uh, you know the disk usage you know when you're trying to write logs or database or things like that you may have disk issues 
So very good. I mean, uh, there are several such problems that, uh, as you guys have highlighted, that can occur, uh, that can cause problem from a resiliency point of view uh, for your uh, services, right? Uh, so uh, what kinds of testing would you now perform uh, to make sure that uh, you know your application is actually resilient, right? So a lot of you talked about the kinds of problems that can occur, but now uh, what kind of testing would you do to ensure that your service is resilient? Can you go ahead and put that in chat? Okay, so I see chaos testing, I see load testing, very good. What else uh, do you anticipate? what happened if only kafka down then how do we resolve it yeah i mean but what kinds of testing would you do i see uh, neha is saying contract testing uh, jitu is saying chaos and resiliency testing okay so load testing couple of chaos testing contract testing uh, any other kinds of things like something even more simpler that i think is important to make sure that we test Okay, maybe let me jump ahead and get to it. So here's, in my opinion, uh, not an exhaustive list, but a uh, you know a kind of more pragmatic list that you would uh, use on a day-to-day -day basis when you're testing resiliency of your services. Uh, the first and the very simple one that I think a lot of us already practice is the negative functional testing, uh, you know, where you're doing boundary value testing, where you're doing equivalence partitioning, where you're doing invalid data types, uh, schema invalid validations, where you're testing for format uh, uh, validations, underflow, overflow kind of conditions and stuff like that. These are all in the realm of functional testing, but more negative functional testing, right? So this is like bread and butter in my opinion, right? Like we would do this uh, very often. The little bit more than sophistication on top of that could be, you know, service dependency testing. And I think Neha already pointed out contract testing, but backward compatibility testing is also very important from a resiliency point of view. Uh, you know, if, if a new version of your app or BFF uh, API was released and that made a backward breaking change, then uh, you know basically the apps will face an issue, right? So that also will make your service non-resilient or non-non-available. Uh, uh, and a lot of people talked about chaos uh, engineering and chaos testing in general. So under chaos engineering, you have several different kinds of testing. The first one is fault injection testing. So you may inject or induce a fault by bringing down a service to see how resilient the service is. Uh, you may want to do failover testing, which is basically you bring down, uh, you know, if you have multiple pods, you br bring down one of them and see if the traffic fails over to the other pod without causing a outage, uh, right? You may also uh, want to test for, like, for example, recovery from a database. So you might want to, uh, you know, try and restore from, uh, uh, you know, your uh, database backups and see if that recovery uh, testing is working fine. Uh, you may want to do partial failures in your network and you may want to see if uh, you know it's still responding within the uh, uh, given SLA uh, from a response time perspective, right? So you may uh, do a lot of chaos engineering uh, and, uh, and related chaos testing uh, in this context. Uh, let's move a little bit more. Some people already talked about uh, performance testing. In performance testing also, we have several different types of performance testing, starting with uh, load testing, then stress testing, soak testing, uh, you know, things perform well uh, for a few hours and and then maybe a few uh, hours later or a few days later, suddenly things start becoming slow uh, and there may be memory leaking, uh, memory leak issues. There may be file uh, descriptor running out of file descriptor or disk or other kinds of things that may cause uh, these kinds of issues. So soak testing becomes again very important from that perspective. Latency testing, concurrency testing, you know, uh, what happens if the exact same user is logged in from two devices and is trying to make a request uh, you know, which one gets honored, how does it work, you know, like, so those kinds of concurrency testing uh, and just uh, bombarding service, uh, the service with a lot of uh, requests as well, but that is already covered under load testing. 
Uh, of course, security testing is very important, you know, right from SQL injection to cross-site scripting to unauthorized access to session expiry, you know, whether the sessions are expiring correctly. You may then have a host of pen penetration testing or pen tests that you might do. You may want to do DDoS attacks to make sure your firewalls and other kinds of things are uh, resilient and they're holding up things. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, people may do vulnerability scans to try and find uh, known vulnerabilities that they can exploit and so forth. So again, that's important from a testing point of view. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, in, in spite of all of this testing, you may still want to make sure that you, uh, you know, test your observability monitoring and alerting itself that it does, uh, you know, uh, uh, give you the alert at the right time, whether the right data is being uh, visible on the dashboards and whether you're able to do deep tracing and other kinds of uh, observability related practices, right? So all of these things, in my opinion, again, not an exhaustive list, but something that, uh, you know, we use on a very regular basis at work is what I would categorize under resiliency testing. Uh, of course, this session, unfortunately, is only 45 minutes long and I won't be able to cover each and every topic in detail. Uh, but my hope is to cover the things on the left side and show you some actual demos of how you would go about uh, doing things, uh, you know, from a uh, functional testing, negative functional testing, the dependency pieces, uh, contract uh, testing specifically, and then a little bit of fault injection uh, related testing. Okay, so we will cover the ones on the left. The ones on the right, I think uh, we might need a separate session, but I just wanted from a completeness point of view, wanted to uh, uh, call these things out. Okay, so uh, jumping in, right? Like the first thing that I want to kind of uh, tackle today is both the negative functional API testing and service dependency testing. Uh, and here I want to introduce you to the concept of contracts, API contracts, and how you could actually leverage API contracts to be able to do, uh, to tick off these two boxes for you, right? Um, but often people say, hey, what is a contract? There is a lot of confusion in terms of what does an actual contract mean? So I'm going to take a quick minute and just kind of uh, set the stage. So make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to what is a contract, right? So let's imagine I want to evaluate this expression, right? 30.1 into 43.74 plus 22 divided by 7. So if you think about it, I might first make a request for 30.1 into, so I would uh, evaluate the multiplication. Then I would evaluate the division and then I would take the results from both and then I would add the two and that would give me the final answer, right? Like, so this is a very simple interaction. I can now represent this more like an API call that all of us can relate to. Uh, so this is, you know, I'm more, posting a message to slash calculator with a left-hand side, a right-hand side, and an operator, and essentially doing the same for the three, you know, multiplication, division, and addition. Uh, I'm hoping this is something everyone can relate to, right? So now from an API testing point of view, something that all of you are familiar with, from an API testing point of view, what are the kinds of tests one would consider doing on this, right? So I might send, uh, you know, uh, 30.1 and 43.74, multiply and I would expect a 200 response back with this kind of a result, right? That is what I would validate or assert in my test. Then I, and of course, I would also store the result uh, because I want to uh, add this later. I might also want to do negative numbers and see if, uh, you know, negative numbers are being handled correctly or not. Uh, I should get back a negative result in this case, right? I might want to do a little bit of now we're getting into uh, data type validation and boundary conditions and uh, things like that, where I might want to send A, B, C, and see uh, what happens, right? Uh, and of course, you should be getting a 400 bad request with saying invalid uh, left-hand side value. Uh, you know, the response type, the uh, HTTP response type, uh, uh, or rather HTTP status and the error message are all important to be validated in your tests, right? You may also want to play around with the operator itself. The operators are fixed and they are of specific type, but if you try and send something that's kind of completely invalid, again, you should get a 400 response back with a valid response, uh, with a valid reason for it, right? So the 
these are all i'm hoping you know kinds of things that uh, one would perform these are more on the functional negative uh, positive and negative side of uh, things that one would uh, kind of perform in this case of course you can chain these methods together and then do api workflow tests but here let's just focus on the api test point of view now Coming back to the original question, what is the contract, right? Uh, I think someone mentioned that we can do contract testing. So uh, what does what does a contract mean in this case, right? Uh, th there is a specific agreement between the consumer of the service and the provider of the service in terms of the data types, the schema, uh, the API signatures, the, the possible response codes, and so forth, right? That has been agreed upon. That's what is kind of the API signature or like, the uh, API contract, if you will. Uh, there is one very popular, uh, you know, uh, specification format for capturing this. It's called Open API Specification. The older name for this is Swagger. Uh, a lot of you might be familiar with Swagger. Open API has been around for a while as well. Uh, so Open API is one way in which you can basically say, "Hey, this is my Open API 3.0 version uh, of the specification, and I have a path called slash calculator. It has a post method, and it can have possible 200 responses." Uh, it can have 400 responses. And here is the re re request body that it can take, which is basically has a left-hand side, a right-hand side, and an operator. So as you can see, all three are required, uh, but you can also, you'll also notice that uh, the op, which is operation, is, uh, is a type of enum, which can be only these four possible values. Right now, this I would say is a pretty decent contract that basically would allow, uh, you know, the the what the provider and the consumer have agreed upon to be captured pretty nicely in this document. Now, once you have this, the advantage of this is that a lot of these tests that you're looking at uh, in terms of basically if I send two valid numbers in the left-hand side and right-hand side and I pick one of the operations from the enum that is there, then I expect a 200 result back with the a positive like with a positive number right uh, similarly i could generate these tests i could also generate these tests so what ends up happening is now from a, a resiliency testing point of view and from a contract testing point of view a lot of this can be taken care for you without you having to write all of these things so that much feedback is shifted left to the developers and they can get this feedback right away in their ide right so that's kind of quickly just explaining what a contract test can do now, how does this doing this help you improve your resiliency, right? So there's two parts to it. One is now you don't really need to keep sitting and manually verifying or writing automated API tests for things like these. These automated tests can be generated right into the in the developer's IDE, and they could get this feedback in terms of basically ensuring that they're sticking to the contract, right? Uh, and you know, and if if things outside the contract is presented to them, then the provider can gracefully handle them, right? The provider can gracefully handle them on the API side and respond back with valid status codes and response messages. Uh, so that reduces a number of things you have to worry from a resiliency point of view. Now you can take this even better and even further and try and do a lot of your boundary case conditions. You can do you know, several other kinds of, uh, in including fault injection. And that's kind of the next section once we understand this uh, so far. What you will notice is in this specific example, uh, what I explained to you, we've, we've taken inspiration from a couple of different styles of testing. And I think it's important to understand those different styles of testing that were at play. Uh, you will notice here that we try to, uh, you know, intentionally introduce a, a variant of the request that was not a valid variant and we wanted to make sure that that came back with a 400 bad request right uh, so that's kind of a little bit of what mutation testing is all about right uh, quick show of hand if you are familiar with mutation testing is something you practice at your work okay i see two people that's great perfect uh, so that's fine. Don't worry. I'm going to take a few minutes to explain what mutation testing is. I also have a sample uh, example for you to kind of walk you through. Uh, but the idea is very simple. In fact, this is kind of uh, a little bit, I, I think it's worth uh, 
like a little side tour here and talk about uh, you know like some of the genesis of this right uh, i don't know if uh, you guys remember back in the days when agile was in its glory days and everyone was like you know agile and scrum uh, everything uh, one of the things that became very uh, caught caught like a wildfire and a lot of companies was basically having uh, code coverage you know everything should have at least 70% code coverage uh, in some organizations went even more crazier and they said 80% or 90% right uh, and what ended up happening is a lot of organizations, engineers uh, under pressure, uh, you know, to basically uh, ship things. Uh, but the criteria was you had to have 80 or 90 percent code coverage. What they started ended up doing is they just started writing tests without having like assert statements or without kind of doing things. And that would give you the code coverage, uh, you know, which is what the management wanted, but really didn't get much benefit because uh, the assertions were not good, the quality of the tests were not great and so forth. People just wrote them to tick a box and move forward, right? Uh, and then the leadership woke up after some time and they're like, hey, we, you know, we've invested so much, we're getting people to write all these unit tests and we have like 80% coverage, but still the bug leakage is very high. You know, we're still not able to catch this what's going wrong, right? And that's where I remember uh, going to a few organizations and saying, well, uh, how do you know the quality of your code and the quality of your tests is good? And they said, of course, it is good because the coverage is very high. I'm like, coverage just tells you intentionally or accidentally what got covered. It doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the test. And that's kind of when, you know, mutation testing uh, was introduced into a lot of organizations. So what mutation testing does is it takes your source code it mutates your source code. It basically changes certain, uh, you know, like for example, if there's an and condition, it'll make it, it'll turn it into an or condition. Uh, it'll like start, try to mutate your code, right? And it'll produce mutants of, of that particular code. And then it'll take your test cases and run against the mutants. And it would expect that you should be able to kill all these mutants uh, you know, uh, uh, what does that mean? That basically means that the test should fail uh, when you run against the mutant, which shows that the test is actually able to catch uh, silly mistakes or able to catch problems in the code, right? And if the, if the mutant survived, that basically means your tests are no, no good, right? Like they're not able to catch these mutants. These are intentionally introduced, uh, uh, you know, bugs or uh, errors in the, in the code. And you would expect that your test should catch it. And ideally you should, when you run this uh, mutation test, uh, if you're written high quality code and high quality tests, then all mutations will not survive and everything will be caught that's what will give you confidence uh that mutation testing uh that is what is uh you know hi let's look at this example okay i have a very simple uh class of us let me show you the tests what i'm doing here essentially is i'm basically uh you know creating durations and i'm verifying that uh it's giving me the closest matching duration for a given uh you know set of tests and so what we will do here is we'll quickly run these tests and we will see what happens. Uh, it's a very small piece of code, has only about uh, five tests. And at this point, you will see all five tests have passed. Uh, the code here is just trying to find you the closest matching duration for a given last seen time. Uh, in a lot of uh, apps, you would see, you know, like in WhatsApp, for example, you'll see last seen one minute ago or five hours ago or five days ago. So it gives you like the closest matching last duration based on your last activity time, right? That's what this little program is doing. So now let me basically uh, run this guy. Okay. Uh, and let's see, you know, what happens. So I'm basically running mutation testing. I'm using a tool called PIT, uh, you know, uh, for mutation testing. Uh, and then I'm also getting Jacoco to produce my coverage report. All right. So it's done its magic. I hope you can see the screen. So here it says, well, I have, uh, you know, 100% branch coverage, I have 100% uh, you know, line coverage. So everything basically in this code is fully covered, right? So this should mean that 
essentially the the code that i have written is very high quality of course and it's 100% covered so there shouldn't be any problem at all and i should be able to ship this into production correct i've got 100% line coverage i have 100% branch coverage what could possibly go wrong well let's quickly look at uh, you know what the mutation testing report says you know so mutation testing bit in this case generates a very similar report uh, and you would see that it's saying, well, uh, sure, you have full coverage on in terms of line coverage, 100%, but your mutation coverage is actually only 17, right? So out of six mutants that we produced, your test is able to only catch one of the mutants, uh, which, which means your quality of the test is pretty poor, right? Uh, so let's look at what, what actually went on here, okay? I'm going to uh, zoom in this a little bit. And here it gives you the list of mutations that it performed. And it uh, highlights the one that survived in red, which is bad news. And the one that it killed in, uh, you know, in green, which is good news. Uh, so you'd see that replace long substitution, uh, subtraction with addition, right? So there is a subtraction that it uh, replaced with addition over here. And then it's it tried to see if, if after making the change, ideally your uh, test should have failed right but in this case my test did not fail uh you know it it uh, it still continued to work uh so what 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 do you think went wrong okay well what went wrong is basically let's go look at the tests you would see that uh you know by mistake instead of saying assert equals i've basically said assert not null so basically whatever came back just make sure that it's not null right uh, and i'm not really asserting uh, it should be one minute ago which is what it should have done but i've just asserted it's not null and while this might look silly i can tell you there's so many places where you would see uh, you know uh, tests written this way so let's basically uh, try and fix this. I'm just going to uh, uncomment this out. Uh, and then let's basically run all our tests. Now let's make this asset equals. And then I'm going to do the same thing. Just run this. And you notice that it's pretty fast. It gives you the mutation, you know, coverage pretty quickly. Uh, and okay, branch coverage is of course still 100, uh, but now you'll see the mutation score has also gone 100%, which means that, you know, all the different mutants that it produced, we were able to, you know, catch all those mutants and we were able to, our test was able to kill all those mutants, right? So this is one example that basically ensures that your you know, your code is very resilient, right? It, like you're, you're intentionally introducing these mutants and trying to verify whether they break or not, right? So we are doing this more from a unit test point of view, but I mean, the concept applies across, right? So the point of explaining this is to make sure that you understand the concept, okay? So that's the first concept that we kind of uh, took inspiration from. Uh, there is a second concept that I'm going to introduce that we can take inspiration from. Uh, I'm hoping everyone's uh, clear with uh, mutation testing, so I'm going to move ahead. I might run short of time. Uh, so the second concept that is important to understand is essentially property-based testing. Uh, in property-based testing, what we do is we basically define uh, the system as a set of properties that it adheres to, and then, uh, you know, generate lots and lots of different data to make sure that under all those conditions, those properties are still held uh, true by the tests, right, uh, by the system, sorry. Uh, so what does that mean? This seems a little bit too much mouthful, right? So let's try and look at an example and see if, uh, you know, that kind of makes sense. Uh, so let's look at here. I'm going to try and increase the font a little bit, maybe too much. Okay, uh, so I have a simple sorting test, right? Uh, maybe before that, let's look at this test. This is a little bit more easier for people to grok. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to reverse a list and I'm making, I want to make sure that my reverse method is actually, uh, you know, uh, doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, 
so one way that a lot of you might be used to writing unit tests is something like this, right? So I would basically say, here's a list one, two, three. Uh, you know, this is the my collection that I'm interested in testing and specifically the reverse method inside that. And then I would say reverse this and then assert that it contains exactly three, two, one and is equal to this order list exactly three to one after reversing, right? This is typically how uh, one would write unit tests for testing things like this, but this uh, may not be sufficient. Then you might think, okay, what happens if the list contains only one or what happens if the list is empty or what happens if the list has, you know, hundreds of element, you know, like do I need to sit and manually test each of these combinations? Uh, that might be too much to, to write all of these, right? So what ends up happening is, you know, there is a uh, property that you can say that when I reverse the list twice, I should get back the original rest, right? Uh, that's now a property of reverse. Uh, reversing something twice gives you back the original thing. So that's what we are trying to do here is we are trying to say basically reverse reverse should be equal to the original list. And the original list now could be an empty list, could be a single item list, could be a multi item list. And essentially, if you uh, run this test, then it would uh, you know test for all these different combinations for you, right? So I'm just going to quickly run this. Uh, this is really not showing you the power of property-based testing yet, but this is just showing you how to think in terms of properties, right? Like this is a round trip test, we would say, where you're basically, uh, you know, adding something twice, making something, you're, you're doing something twice to get back the original thing. So it's a round trip in that sense. And that's one of the common ways in which people kind of uh, generally do, uh, sorry, I ended up kicking a wrong one. Uh, so you should see four tests and all four tests passing. Right. This is fine, uh, but I still had to write all these different, uh, you know, combinations myself. Right. Uh, so can I do something even better than this? Uh, so let's go look at a, a slightly different property test, which will kind of make this even more interesting for you is uh, I have a property that, uh, you know, I should be able to sort a list. And after I sort the list, uh, you know, everything should be in a sorted order. So what I'm doing is I'm giving an unsorted list. Uh, I'm saying sort ascending, and then I'm verifying it's asserted. Now, in this case, when I run this test, it's gonna go ahead and uh, test it with a several different combinations uh, over here. And then it will tell me that with all those combinations, your sorting is working fine. Uh, but for some reason, let's say, you know, I ended up making a mistake in my algorithm, right? Uh, let's say I did something like this. That's my uh, main method that I'm sorting, right? Then what should happen? Of course, this one still passed because I'm not really checking for the zero condition. And you can see that this guy is warning me, right? But the, like the mistake could be me actually putting here zero, which means they are equal. Okay. Will this catch it? And certainly it did. What was the uh, error message? So it says it tried 22 different combinations. It tried one of these combinations and after sorting, uh, you know, it got this result back versus it should have got minus one, zero and one uh, back. Uh, and it's tried several different combinations for you. And finally it kind of distills down to, you know, one uh, example that can demonstrate uh, where things went wrong. Uh, so again, notice here, unlike in the previous case, I didn't write all those different combinations myself. I simply defined this as a property and this allowed me to simply go ahead and generate several different combinations for you, uh, for me. Uh, so I'm just going to fix this back and make sure that I leave the test in a working state. But that's an example of a property-based testing where we basically defining uh, a property in this case, in the previous case, it was a round trip. In this case, we are saying after ascending, you know, this is how sorting should work. And this will then allow you to basically generate a whole bunch of different examples and make sure under all kinds of conditions, your sorting is still working as expected. So this is like a second inspiration from a, a testing and optimizing your testing point 
point of view to make things more resilient. Now, how do these two make sense, right? Like, so now let's try and put all of these together uh, and then we should be able to uh, quickly wrap up the session at the end of this. How much time do I have left, uh, Shalom? Uh, we have 14 minutes left. 14 minutes, perfect. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so that is good. I'm at the right time. Yeah. So now, remember, we go back to this example, and I want to take some of these learnings that I showed you in terms of mutation testing, in terms of property-based testing, and try and bring it back to a more real-world examples where we are trying to test APIs and see how that can be leveraged, right? So uh, let's say I, my system under test is the BFF layer. Uh, this is what I'm interested in testing. These are my dependencies for the BFF, and I want to basically abstract the dependencies away. And then these are, uh, you know, the, the, the app itself is the test, but I don't really want the app. I'm going to replace that uh, with, a, with a different thing that would basically test the BFF for me. And uh, it will stub out, I'm going to stub out the domain service and the uh, Kafka piece so that I'm able to test uh, under all different conditions and make sure that the BFF itself is resilient, right? Uh, so by doing this, I would be able to inject faults because that's under my control now and see if the BFF works fine. I might uh, be able to give it all kinds of boundary case inputs and make sure that it performs correctly. But something has to guide us in terms of how to give all these boundary case tests and so forth. And that's where you know, we leverage an open API specification and we derive properties out of it, right? Uh, so in, uh, in the previous case, you saw that you, know, you had to write the property by hand, which is fine. But in, in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the open API specification or the async API specification. We're going to derive properties out of it at runtime and then generate tests on top of that to be able to test if your BFF is resilient or not. Okay, so let's quickly jump into a uh, live demo and see uh, what happens. So I'm going to quickly go here to this example and I'm going to run my contract test and I've introduced a uh, an error intentionally here uh, so that we can see what happens. Uh, let me just show you the test that I have. Uh, hopefully you can see this. Uh, this is the test that I have. Uh, so this is basically saying where the application uh, is running the host and port. Uh, you know, I'm basically saying where are my stubs for the dependencies that I have and where is Kafka running so I would be able to basically, uh, and of course, real Kafka uh, broker is not running. We've stubbed that out. We have a in-memory uh, stubbed out version of the Kafka broker. And then we start our application uh, and then we have basically a teardown. That's it. But where are the tests? I have a setup and I have a teardown. I don't see any tests here. Okay, that's interesting. So let's see what happened here. Uh, nothing should have run. Oh, uh, because I've not written any tests, I expected nothing to run, but I see 90 tests have run here. You see 90 tests have run, 81 have passed and nine have failed. Where did all these tests come from? Right. Let's look at one of these tests. It's basically saying I'm testing a positive scenario on post slash products, and I'm testing for a 201 success case. Okay, so what we will see here is our tests have made a post request to slash products, and essentially it is sent this payload as the input to the request. And then it's got a response back from the server saying 200 okay, and it's given an ID eight. And it's basically said, well, if that's the case, then all of this looks good and I'm gonna pass this test. And then it's got another test where it's kind of doing something very similar, iPhone book one. Uh, if you notice in the previous case, we were doing uh, iPhone gadget 100, in this case, we are doing iPhone book inventory one. And again, we got a result back and everything looks good. So this guy is saying, well, I'll pass this test. Uh, so it's generated a whole bunch of these uh, you know, request payloads and it's very 
modified the response payload and made sure that that is as per uh, the properties that we have derived from the specification. Where is our specification? Let's look at our specification. Let's look at this in this. So what you will see is, uh, this is my specification that I've opened. That is the BFF API specification. This is like I highlighted earlier, this is an open API specification. And essentially in this, you would see there are three different paths, find available products slash orders and slash products. Uh, slash products has only one uh, method, which is a post method, and it can respond back with 201, 400, and 503. Okay. So this is really what, uh, you know, this testing tool that we're using here is gone and looked at, and then it's derived certain properties from it and basis that it's generated a bunch of positive tests for us. Uh, but it didn't just stop at a bunch of positive tests. You would also see that it's generated a bunch of negative tests for us. Uh, so let's look at one of the negative tests and see what happened here, right? So again, we're looking at post slash products and it's made a request and notice here this time and the name also suggests here that request body name string mutated to null, okay? Uh, so it's intentionally mutating the name to null uh, but name itself as you will see here in the request body uh, is a mandatory field and it's a non-nullable field okay so it cannot be null but from uh, what we had learned from mutation testing is i'm actually producing a mutant of not the source code in this case but a mutant of my request and i'm basically sending that request and i'm seeing whether there are validations that the the developer has implemented correctly or not right the api developer have they implemented the correct validations for this or not and sure enough when i send a null uh, the servers responded back with a 400 bad request and it's given me in the format i'm expecting the error message and it's basically given a parse error saying you cannot instantiate this uh, which is uh, which is fine. I mean, maybe it's a little too leaky abstraction at this point, which maybe could have uh, summarized this a little better, but that's fine. At least I'm happy that there is a validation in place, right? So no, what? I think yes. we're running out of time. It's 46, 14, yeah. We have oh, one, okay. Yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt. And we have one question from Neha, who would really like to take it up in between. One question. Sure, sure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Neha says that sometimes the, the backend for front end, uh, when they're passing uh, incorrect response and the correct data saved in the Redis, then also they are getting the correct response from the Kafka itself. So how this can be identified? Yeah, so that's a great question. When uh, I'll, I'll answer the second piece first is essentially when a downstream dependency like Kafka or Redis or whatever, right? Like that's basically uh, giving you back here because you are able to stub it out. You can have a control over what it's going to give you, right? But if you're using a real Kafka, then you don't have control over it. And that's generally the problem where you won't be able to do all kinds of resiliency testing. Uh, but in this case, you're actually able to stub it out and uh, you know, in your test, you'd be able to set expectation that, uh, like I showed you, uh, let me quickly jump here. Uh, uh, there is, if I go in my uh, tests resources, you will see there's a whole bunch of uh, stubs that have uh, actually got generated. And in this one of these stubs, you will see I've intentionally put a delay of five seconds, right? So now I'm controlling that the domain service when it responds back, or in this case, if the Kafka were to uh, you know not create a topic and I'm still putting something on that topic or things like that, you know, the, the, I'm in, intentionally introducing a delay over here and I'm making sure that my service when it times out is handling it gracefully. So that's uh, hopefully like that's kind of the answer is that don't rely on the actual uh, database or the actual service or things like that because you don't have control over that. Uh, instead, you would be able to induce this uh, and uh, be able to, uh, you know, you'd be able to stub it out and then induce the fault and have a control over that. And those can be controlled through your tests. Thanks, Narayan. It's really indeed a detailed answer and it's a pleasure, you know, to, you know, go through the session. It's, I feel like it should not be end soon, but yeah, it was a great learning for all of us. All right. Sorry, yeah. I little overshot a little over time, but uh, hopefully I've covered most of the things 
topics that I wanted to cover. So again, thanks everyone.